Hey everyone, this is Kevin from thechesswebsite.com, and today we're going to be going over Rubenstein's Immortal Game. This is a keeper Rubenstein, the Polish Grandmaster from the early 1900s, widely regarded as one of the strongest chess players never to win the World Championship. Part of that's due to bad luck. In 1914, at the top of his game, he was set to face Lasker for the World Championship. That event was canceled due to World War I starting. A few years prior to that, 1907, faced off against another Polish chess master, George Rot Louis. That is the game we're going to be going over today. Two of the strongest Polish chess players at the time. I flipped the board since Akiba Rubinstein is going to be playing the black pieces. So we'll go ahead and start with d4, d5, knight f3, pawn e6, uh, e3. And pawn to c5, and after c4, this is the Tarash opening, the symmetrical variation, as you can see. Uh, this is looking like the Queen's Gambit decline line. After knight to c6, knight c3, and knight to f6, you can see both sides have the exact same setup. And this is where one side decides to go ahead and exchange the material. We do see the pawn take here on c5. The bishop recaptures, so this is always a good way to recapture, get your dark square bishop involved into the game. This is now attacking this long diagonal right here, controlling those dark squares. Now pawn to a3. This is stopping the knight coming to b4, um, or even the bishop coming down to b4, pinning down the knight to the king. Also opens up the door uh, if Raloui wants to push on the queen side has a nice little pawn structure could play pawn to b4 later on play pawn to c5 make things difficult for rubenstein akiba decides to do a similar move plays pawn to a6 stopping the threat of the knight coming to b5 then b4 pushing the bishop back bishop has a couple moves some players tend to go for bishop to a7 trying to still control this long diagonal bobby fisher used to do that quite often uh, akiba decides to go ahead and bring the bishop to d6 wants to still keep that very centralized in the game bishop to b2 so fian kettering the bishop here trying to attack this long dark square diagonal and then we have castle on the king side and then queen to d2. Now, since all the pawns are pushed forward on the queen side, still going to be castling on the king side of the board. Thought we may see the bishop come into the game first, castle. But we do see queen to d2. Now queen to e7. And then bishop to d3. Did have the option since the queen and the knight here are both attacking this square here. To take, maybe there's recapture, knight takes, knight takes here, uh, queen takes. You could see rook to d8 preparing for discovered attack once the bishop moves. Uh, maybe queen comes back here to b3. Uh, decided to look at this position and George said, no, that's not exactly what I'm looking to do here. Uh, so while he did have that option, decided to go ahead and play bishop to d3. Now the pawn takes, and then the bishop takes here on c4. So it is opening up the board state a little bit here. Uh, pawn to b4, attacking the bishop. The bishop comes back to d3, and rook to d8. This is a open file here, so getting the rooks involved into the game. They can control a lot more of the game when they are on these open files or semi-open file when there's only one pawn here. They just tend to do much better, especially in the center of the board. Queen to e2 wants to make sure that there's no shenanigans with a discovered attack once the bishop moves. Uh, if the bishop was not here, that would be attacking the queen here on a d2. So wants to get that out of the way. And then bishop to b7. So we have white eyeing down both of the bishops on the king side for black. And we have Rubenstein over here eyeing both of his bishops here on a d6 and b7 at the king side for white. So it does look like we could have some fireworks as both sides uh, start to line up and attack on their opponent's king side. Castle on the king side and then knight to e5. Positioning his pieces over to the king side, also opening up the door for the slight square bishop to really start to attack his opponent. We do see an exchange on the board and then pawn to f 
four. And this is where things start to get pretty interesting because this does open up for a strong attack uh, that Rubenstein can start to have. There's a backward pawn here on e3, and there's a little bit of room in front of the king on the white side of the board. The bishop comes back to a c7, and then pawn to e4. And this definitely opens things up. Black was already going to be coming here to uh, b6, probably before his opponent played pawn to e4. But now that he has this, he he knows he has check at some point. So before he does that, he does an in-between move, and that is rook to c8. He says, if I'm going to play bishop to b6 with check, I want to have a discovered attack. He's going to be attacking this knight here on c3. So, uh, so just preparing things coming up, knowing that... Uh, this king here on g1 can be under attack. Now pawn to e5, uh, and now decides, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and attack here with bishop to b6. Yes, you're attacking a knight, but I can go ahead and move that later. I'm going to go ahead and put you in check. So we see king to h1, and now a very wise move uh, from Rubenstein, and you can imagine is his immortal game, one of the strongest chess players out there, you're going to see a lot of high level chess moves. And the first one is knight to g4. And this is a great deflection. You can see that the queen can take here on g4, but the queen's also the sole defender of the bishop here on d3. And this is a very critical bishop in the center of the board. Uh, and so Rubenstein says, yeah, if you want to go ahead and take my knight here, I have both of my bishops eyeing down on your king right now that doesn't have a lot of protection. So if you want to do that, that is completely fine. So in the game, uh, that's not what we see. We see bishop here to e4. Now, if the queen did decide to take, we have the rook come up here to uh, d3. And then how does white really continue? Maybe rook to d1. Then the rook could take on c3. Bishop takes, rook comes up here to c3. Uh, so that's pretty tough. Maybe instead after the rook takes on d3, we see knight to d1. Okay, well now rook to c2. And this is the deadly move right here. How does white actually respond to this? Maybe rook to c1 uh, and then queen to, after rook to c1, queen to h4. And this gets really tricky from white's perspective as far as how they actually continue. You can see after the queen takes here on h4, bishop to g2 with the protection of the rook and the bishop here on b6, this is going to be checkmate. So you can't do that. Things just look extremely bad. So in the game, uh, after the knight comes to g4, we do see that George plays bishop to e4. Rubenstein sensing something out there that he can attack decides to go ahead and play queen to h4 and from here pawn to g3 and this is where things get pretty interesting because now both of these bishops are eyeing down all the critical squares that the king can actually go to so now that the pawn has come up here this bishop is the one saving piece that white has going for him if this bishop is not here the game is essentially over so Rubenstein knows that he's going to spend the rest of the game trying to attack this square right here. Now, most players, if they look at this pawn to g3, they would say, okay, my queen's under attack. I'm going to go ahead and bring uh, my queen back here to e7 and not worry about it. But Rubenstein, that's not what he does. He recognizes that there's an opportunity to attack and he plays rook takes on c3. Now, there's a couple ways for white to respond here. If he decides, let's go ahead and take with my bishop here. He could take bishop on c3. Then you see bishop takes e4. Uh, and this is really tough to deal with. Uh, we already know that if the queen comes down here, this is going to be checkmate. So that's not going to work right there. Uh, if instead we see rook to f3, okay, well now the bishop takes here, attacking the queen attacking the king as well. Uh, this is just a no way to really stop this. This would be a great mate if it happened like this because the king can't take, because the knight, the queen can't take here because it's being pinned down by uh, the bishop. So there's no real great way to actually respond 
with the rook coming up here to c3. Now, we have looked at this critical square on e4 uh, because it's being pinned down by the bishop on b7. So it does have the option. It could try to take here on b7. And then the rook comes over here to g3. This pawn can't move because it's being pinned down by the queen. Things are going to be extremely bad as far as what does white do from here. Maybe rook to uh, g1. But then you could just have an exchange here on a g1, knight to f2, uh, check, queen takes here, queen takes on f2. There's just no real good way to actually end this. Black is going to have a very good game. So after the rook takes on c3, hey, offering up a queen here, I'm going to go ahead and take that queen here on h4. And now the move, rook to d2. And this is another deflection uh, move because it says, hey, what are you going to do if you take here? Uh, yeah, that's just a decoy because I'm going to bring my bishop up here to e4, take, and then you're in a world of trouble. So what do you actually do? But the problem is there's not many other good moves uh, for George to do here. So at the end of the day, he actually decides to go ahead and take here on d2. No other good options. The bishop takes on e4, check, and now there's no way to stop this. He has to bring his queen over here, and now rook to h3. And you can see the moves keep getting better and better because he, he could easily just take this queen here on g2, but he has lost his, his queen. He knows that he's going for something greater than just getting that queen back. He plays rook to uh, h3, and out of all the moves, there's many fantastic moves. This is such a, a great square because many players would even feel like, yeah, I have to go ahead and take this material back uh, and then I'll maybe try something with my knight. I'll bring my knight here to e2. I'll fork the the king and the rook here. I'll get that rook and maybe I'll have a good end game. But Rubenstein decides, yeah, I think I can have a stronger attack here. So he plays rook to h3. And at this point in the game, uh, his opponent does resign. So let's look at the options as far as how white could continue. Uh, one of those would be bishop to d4. Bishop takes here on d4. Uh, there's no real good way to continue here. Rook to f3, bishop takes. The queen takes and then rook up here. That is going to be checkmate. If we come back a few moves, another option would be rook to f3. This stops it, but then the bishop takes. Bishop down here, just delaying the inevitable after the queen takes. The rook finishes here on h2. And then lastly, we could have rook come to f2. Bishop takes on f2. The queen can come down here, uh, but then this is going to be checkmate as well. So after the rook to h3, uh, George looked at it and said, yeah, good, good game. There's no way to stop this sacrificing the queen and just eyeing all this material up against his opponent was too much for him to deal with. So that was Rubenstein's Immortal Game. Fantastic game. Always fun to see these uh, epic games from some of the best players to ever play the game of chess, sacrificing their pieces, using all of the material on the board to put their opponent in some really difficult spots, uh, and then finding the best moves, even when there's some really good moves that I think a lot of people would always look for, uh, but they found something even better and that's why these games are immortalized so hopefully you guys enjoyed that video hopefully you're enjoying some of these famous games that i'm putting out there and until next time i see you guys then